Hello and welcome everyone to the second installment of the event series, Radical Diversity. My name is Grant Amond, the director of the Go to Pop Up in Houston, Texas. Uh, before we get started today, I'd like to mention that this discussion will be simultaneously translated into Spanish. Uh, for those who would like to listen to the discussion in Spanish, uh, please click the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom window and select Spanish. This event series takes a critical and multidimensional approach to radical diversity in Germany and North America and examines the challenges and visions of progress that we face in society today. The Radical Diversity series is hosted by the Goethe Institute in North America, along with its pop-up branches, the Thomas Mann House and the Institute for Social and Radical Diversity, Social Justice and Radical Diversity, excuse me, and is sponsored by the Heinrich Böll Stiftung North America. Today, we are bringing the discussion to Houston, Texas, where we will discuss how art and curation can be expressive modes for radical diversity. The discussion will run for about an hour, after which we'll have a Q&A. Please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you may have during the discussion, and we will try to get to as many of, um, as, of them as time will allow. Our moderator is Dr. Max Schodek. He completed his doctorate studies at the Center for Research on Antisemitism at the Technical University Berlin. Since 2009, Dr. Schodek has been a member of the poetry collective G13, which has published books and organized lectures. In 2018, his essay, Desintegrate, um, Desintegrate, was published at Karl Hanser. His second essay, Coping with the Present, will be published in August 2020. Um, I will now hand it over to you, Max. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, as I can't really see you, still I hope you're here and there and you can hear me. I'm really happy to, to have you here for the second part of the series, which is gonna go on until I think December. Um, and as you probably know, we are already past August, so the book has already appeared. Um, King Lutz Bewältigung is out coping with the present, and I am still here. I, I'm sending this from Berlin to you. Um, I don't know where all of you are. I can't see you. I hope you can hear me well. Um, and let me just give you a bit of an idea of what we're doing today. Because last time, the first show, um, I was like, we were two, right? It was Mohammed Amjahid and me. We were doing the moderation together with Priscilla Lane. Um, what we did was we talked about radical diversity in Germany and the US, especially regarding um, um, discourses on discrimination and the way discrimination had been discussed and things that had happened in the last more or less half year, year. So what we're doing today is a bit different because Mohammed Amjahid is not here, obviously, but also because um, we have a bit of a different setup. As you can see, we got three people here today, which I'm really happy that, that you came and joined us uh, today. It's Ashley, Joy, and Corinne. I'm gonna tell you in just a second who they are. Um, and they're gonna give a bit more of an impression of different fields of their work and how this relates to the term or the concept or the practice of radical diversity. Um, so really what we're trying to do is kind of spread out a bit our imagination after the first part um, and try to, at the same time, still bridge this, this, this or, or raise the question of, of how the German context and maybe German-European context and the US-American context, how they interlock or how they interact or how they're different. Um, today, we're doing this in Houston. I'm especially happy we are um, at least screening this from Houston um, because Houston is supposed to be one of the most diverse cities in, in the States, as far as I know. Um, I don't know if it's a good example for a radical diverse practice. We're gonna hear about that a bit later. Um, and for me personally, it's wonderful as well because the first time I ever touched uh, US American soil, if you want so, was in Houston. Uh, because when I, when I, I, I was in, in my high school exchange year, I went to Texas, to the north of Texas, Lubbock, um, which when I tell this to Americans, they usually shake their heads in disbelief and say, why did she spend one year in Lubbock, Texas? The, re like the true answer is, I don't know. But um, they put me there and we had to fly in through Houston. And uh, we had a, actually, we had a flight accident on the way. So we kind of crashed down in Houston. And the first thing I saw was big American firefighters taping people to the kind of kind of uh, uh, bar to, to be kind of carried out and me 
hitting Houston, walking out of the uh, uh, air, airport, and at first kind of having this air in my face and being like, wow, I've never been in a place this hot. So I'm really like, in Berlin, we got the last summer days. Now I am hoping you're still enjoying summer in Houston. And now I'm glad you're here with us with the Radical Diversity 2 series. Um, right. Now, let me give you a bit of an idea of who is here today. Um, just going to go by, uh, by the alphabet. First is going to be Ashley De Ojos, who is a cultural producer and educator born and raised in Baytown, Texas. Um, Ashley received a BFA from Sam Houston State University in 2013 and an MFA in curatorial practice from Maryland Institute College of Art in 2016. As of 2018, Ashley has served as the curator at Diverse Works in Houston, Texas, a place I didn't know before, but it's a very interesting um, art space in Houston, where they have, where Ashley has organized a full range of visual performing and public arts programming. Um, among them, um, Jefferson Pinder Fire and Movement. I saw that online. It's a very interesting work. We may be able to talk about that a bit later. Um, through Ashley's curatorial practice, the audio is focused on creating cultural platforms with intersectional perspectives and speculative futures as Ashley relates to history and the environment. Um, so, as I said, uh, Fire and Movement was one work, the other one was Bajou City Be All LGBTQ Plus Performance Festival and the group exhibition Collective Presence. Um, and Ashley also manages the diverse discourse, which I don't really know what it is, but I think maybe we're going to hear about that, or at least uh, if I ask Ashley, she's going to, she's going to hopefully, hopefully she's going to tell us. The next one uh, in line is Joy. Jeanette Joy Harris, actually, but as this is an in, uh, informal talk, we want to say Joy Harris. Uh, Joy is a Houston-based artist, writer, and curator interested in performance and politics. Um, she was a scholar in residence at the Hannah Arendt Institute at Bard College and, is current, and currently serves on the American Philosophical Association's Committee for Public Philosophy. I find this especially interesting because in Berlin right now, we got a huge Hannah Arendt exhibition, which uh, I just saw today. And I saw a talk today on post-colonialism in Hannah Arendt. So I'm really interested also in that, even though we may not be able to talk about that at all, but still, it's an interesting con connection. Also, uh, Joy is pursuing a PhD in philosophy, art, and critical thought at the European Graduate School right now. And Joy has shown creative works in the US, UK, and EU, and is on the Management Committee for Experimental Action, Houston's Performance Art Biennale. Um, so, and, and the third one, let me just, to, to just finish this up, is Corinne Kastner. Corinne is a political scientist and sociologist whose focus lies within the fields of political philosophy, social justice and diversity, gender theory and politics. She has been a trainer for social justice and diversity since 2013. And I may mention that she's also my colleague because I'm, I also have been a part of the Social Justice and Diversity Institute since 2013. So we've been working together for quite a while. And I'm really happy that also Corinne is joining us to give us a bit more of, of an idea of the concepts behind the title of this series, Radical Diversity, because we have taken this directly from the Institute, um, which is one of the reasons the Institute is a partner and institution for that. And um, so Corinne is currently working as research associate in the project Heidegger and Postmodernity, uh, based at University of Cologne and pursuing a PhD in history of philosophy and political thought at the Technical University of Darmstadt. As you see, we got like a lot of, a lot of different knowledge uh, collected here tonight. Um, it's art, it's work on anti-discrimination, it's theory. Um, let's see how we get this whole thing together. As usually, this is an experiment as last time. Um, we're happy you're joining us. Please feel free to ask questions. And now I'm gonna be quiet and just take one last thing, which is procedure. Now we're gonna have Corinne give a bit of an input of about eight, nine minutes. Then we have Ashley and Joy giving an input together of around 15, 16 minutes. And then we're gonna have a round of like questions and discussing among each other. And then we're gonna to try to kind of in include your questions. So it's important to ask questions 
a grant is going to collect them and then pass them on to us. Yes, so welcome again. I'm going to be quiet now for, for a while. And Corinne and Ashley and Joy, I'm really happy you're here. Uh, and Corinne is going to start. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to speak here. And um, as Max already said, I'd like to talk a little bit about our Institute for Social Justice and Radical Diversity, and especially about the concept of radical diversity and the ways we use it in our theoretical and practical work. So to first give you a little bit of background on the concept itself, what we call social justice and diversity training was developed by Lea Karula Czolek, Gudrun Perko and Heike Weinbach in 2001. The concept draws inspiration from an approach developed in the US, namely Teaching for Diversity and Social Justice written by Maureen Adams, Lee Ann Bell and Pat Griffin in 1997 which Lea Gudrun and Heike then took as a basis to develop a concept designed specifically for the German context. In 2005, Lea Gudrun and Heike founded the Independent Institute for Social Justice and Diversity and offered trainings in the fields of anti-discrimination work in university and in continuing education. In 2012, the first edition of a social justice and diversity training manual was published and around the same time, Max and I joined the Institute as trainers and contributed to the new edition of the manual, which came out last year. In this process of updating and expanding our concept, we also decided to rebrand our Institute um, into Institute for Social Justice and Radical Diversity, the reasons of which I'll explain in a second. So first, what's interesting about how social justice and diversity was adapted to the German context is that it proved to be useful to stick with the English terminology of social justice and diversity in order to highlight conceptual differences to what in Germany was traditionally associated with the term soziale Gerechtigkeit, um, a term that was mainly used in a labor context and was associated primarily with class differences and class empowerment. By speaking of social justice and diversity in the early 2000s, the first generation of our institute signaled the need to broaden the thinking of participation and inclusion beyond the discourse of class struggle. So the question was, what would it mean to take different forms of discrimination seriously? including class, race, gender, but also the specific exclusions of Jews, Sintice in Romnia, people being born in the former GDR, people identifying as trans or non-binary, discrimination based on age, ability, or appearance. How would an awareness of those different forms of discrimination and their intersectionality reshape our understanding of the continuities of violent exclusion and dominance in the German context? Now this idea that there are different forms of discrimination and not only one, and that society is diverse, is at first glance quite intuitive and easy to accept, at least it seems so. <laughs> However, things are getting much more difficult as soon as we look more closely at what diversity could actually mean. In German discourse, the term diversity was in fact quickly adopted as what we always call diversity as an asset. In German, that's die Vielfalt, die mich bereichert. Diversity is here affirmed as something good that can be put into use on the condition that you are first being considered as useful or valuable for society or a company, etc. This also actually came up during your first talk with Priscilla and Mohammed. Somebody spoke of diversity as a brand. This goes in a similar direction. So what is interesting here is that this idea of diversity as an asset in a certain way connects with a very German tradition of a thinking of homogeneity and the control and domestication of differences. 
Diversity is used as a way to differentiate between good and bad groups or individuals. Like this, it can become a tool to selectively integrate and instrumentalize social groups. We see this very prominently in the image of the good integrated migrant that aspires to middle-class life, but not to more, of course, versus those who don't. But also when questions of sexism are reduced to discussing representation of women in management boards, where also class hierarchies are stabilized through this figure of good and bad social groups. This criticism of course also affects institutions or companies that mobilize diversity to improve their image without actually changing anything structurally or who even use diversity to reinforce, for example, class hierarchies. Max and I have recently been speaking of a homogenizing diversity to describe this dynamic. So what we'd say is that this whole tradition of homogeneity and this unwillingness to give up control over what diversity is allowed to be from a mainstream German perspective is one major obstacle when speaking of diversity in the German context. So coming to why we use the term radical diversity then, we first of all want to break with this use of diversity as homogenizing tool. On a theoretical level, this means shifting the discourse of diversity away from a superficial idea of representation to the question of participation. How does society have to look like for people to be able to participate and to be recognized in their different needs and abilities? And what would it mean to actually put this right to equal participation first and stop tolerating the systematic exclusion of groups by lack of access to citizenship, to social goods, to fair payment, but also unequal treatment because of stereotyping, for example. And to have institutions that would in fact be obliged to enable people to realize their ability. We base all of this on Iris Marion Young and Marcel Nussbaum's concepts of justice, which I cannot explain at the moment because of lack of time. Sorry. Um, so we describe radical diversity as a concrete utopia. This means that we envision a society where diversity would actually be the norm and where social justice as the possibility to participate in society without, of course, being forced to participate would already be realized, not as an ideal in the future, but as something that gives us a concrete guideline for taking action. The idea is here to actively transform spaces, institutions, and so on, according to this concrete vision, always within the framework of human rights and nonviolence. For this, we also developed concrete practical strategies that aim to encourage agency in light of radical diversity. And by agency, we really mean that each person can contribute to acting against discrimination in their respective field of activity based on an assessment of privilege and resources that can be shared. Certainly art can play a major role in this relation, in its relation to radical diversity. And I'm very excited to hear more about this in just a second um, from you, Ashley and Joy. Um, maybe just to sum up, what we envision with the concept of radical diversity is a form of agency based on acting together as allies and not on the hierarchization form of forms of discrimination to overcome ideas of cultural dominance that homogenize diversity according to dominant patterns of recognition and to stop tolerating the systematic structural discrimination and instrumentalization of some social groups at the expense of others. Thank you. Thank you, Corinne. Uh, great. Um, um, thank you for this wonderful uh, overview and input. Um, let me just ask you one small question after this, just to, could you expand or explain a bit more about the, the, the concept of agency and how this relates to a critique of discrimination, how it's been done in the Institute? Just to kind of, kind of I, I know you said that, but just to give a bit more of a uh, of, of, of examples or the way you see that connection? 
Um, yes, <laughs> I can do that. Um, yes, I think it is a very crucial point. Um, also, coming from what you were discussing at the Goethe talk last time, like how to come from an analysis of discrimination to the point of action or acting. <laughs> Um, at least this is like this is one central thing that we try to tackle in our institute, in our work at the institute when we do the trainings. So um, what we often notice is that it is quite difficult for people to do both things, like to analyze structures of discrimination with all those categories, um, those very fixed categories, but then on the practical level, um, rethink completely what it means to, to act not according to those, to those um, or not reduced to those categories, but as a autonomous um, response self-responsible person. So this is kind of really a shift. And in our trainings, we try to do both, like to work on both levels. And for this um, agency, this question of agency, we have, for example, two concepts. One concept is called Verbündetsein in, in German. Uh, in, in English, it would be something like allyship. And it is a concept that specifically aims to to facilitate agency um, across social groups. Like um, you don't have to belong to the same group to in order to act, but you can join um, forces based on, on the decision to act against discrimination um, as allies and not as um, people from with the same identity or the same experience. So this is one way um, we encourage this. And the other method would be, would be called maloké. This is a method that um, encourages dialogue and plural thinking um, with a method taken from the Jewish tradition of the um, reading and discussion of texts, of religious texts, where it is really about developing different perspectives on a topic. And this, the, the whole idea to have as many different perspectives as possible is the idea uh, of this method. So on a practical level, we, um, we draw on traditions of plurality and dialogue um, in order to, to think agency. And this tradition of dialogue, as we noticed uh, after um, so, so many years of, like that we noticed after a while of doing those trainings, is basically um, not really established in the German context. So we need to draw on what we call exiled and marginalized perspectives in order to really um, reintroduce this tradition of plural thinking into the German context, um, which is something really interesting because, of course, Germany <laughs> likes to uh, portray itself as um, the super democracy that has to protect itself against the outside. But uh, if we look at it, we need to kind of, we need to draw on concepts uh, from the outside that because Germany um, exiled and expelled so many democratic and pluralist thinkers throughout its history. Um, so yeah, this is, this maybe so much for now. Well, well, Corinne, thank you for bringing this up with the, I think that is one of the, 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 the backgrounds of why we do this series is that there has been a profound movement of thought from Europe to the States and now from the States back to Europe. Um, I mean, you told the story of, the, of, of um, how social justice and diversity was developed by 
people in Germany drawing on concepts in, in the States. But then again, those concepts being developed with the help of European Jew Jewish thinkers, um, and especially that had migrated to the States. So there's a bit of a of a real like historical uh, development on the one hand. And I'm sure there's many more traditions which we haven't raised now, um, uh, which which are going to be going to be going to be raised maybe later on. Um, especially now talking about agency and including different social groups. I was thinking about diverse diverse works as a as a working place and the curatorial practice that Ashley uh, has been doing. Um, so maybe now we just continue with your uh, input, Joy and Ashley, and see uh, how you how you relate to the to the concept and and all of that, and then we're going to engage in in further discussion. Um, thank you, Corinne. Yeah, thank you, Max. Um, so uh, as as you mentioned, I work at Diverse Works, and um, I mean our mission is to present, produce, and commission new and daring work. Um, and one of the things that has been really important to my creative practice, which I see kind of in line with thoughts of radical diversity was in graduate school, I started thinking about what it meant to live and why we had constructs developed by dominant culture. And so a lot of my work has been kind of pulling on um, and, 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 and nodding to histories and trying to ask questions about like how we haven't shifted away from um, certain problems that have been really prevalent in the in the United States. And so when Joy invited me to be part of this conversation, I thought it was a you know really in line with the the way in which I'm trying to organize my curatorial practice. And um and then Joy and I further had a conversation um about too like what does radical diversity mean in a US context right now, considering you know we're seeing a lot of social and cultural movements in response to Black Lives Matter and creating, um, you know, spaces and institutions um, across the United States to, that reflects, that are reflective of the community. Um, I mean, there's a long line of, uh, of different kind of institutional critiques and histories that go with uh, the art and how we're curating and, and the way in which curatorial visions can also contribute to power and privilege. And so, um, one of the things that Joy and I really wanted to start off talking about and, and kind of thinking to in terms of in a U.S. context, what, um, how in order to have radical diversity, you, we still are at a state where we still need to have radical representation and how important ra representation is to the conversation uh, because there still are individuals within our country that don't have a platform that aren't brought to the table um, that are, are engaged in a very way that still does other and oppress. And so we, um, you know, uh, diversity is, is such a hot term here as organizations are trying to figure out how they move forward in a way that is culturally equitable. And so um, when we, Joy and I talked outside of our, our meeting, we, we, you know, we talked a, little, a lot about that and, and about how like representation really does matter. Um, in the United States context because of where we are in our kind of cultural um, history right now, as well as in order to achieve equity or what we would identify as radical equity, we have to have radical diversity and radical representation together. And that if we practice these kind of theories, and Joy, please chime in here too, that, um, that, that we could, and in terms of radical equity, imagine what that would look like in terms of a non-hierarchical uh, practice that involves different um, uh, pluralities and modes of thinking and practice, which I think is similar to how y'all are using radical diversity. Um, and so that's what we, we kind of wanted to talk about. And then more specifically, I think Joy's going to talk about and share with you um, where we are in Houston too, in terms of things. So Joy. Yeah, so one of the examples, first of all, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, Max and Corinne, and um, of course, Ashley, um, for having, um, for being here with us. Um, so um, one of the examples of what we're talking about in terms of radical diversity versus radical representation versus radical equity, I kind of experienced in a project that I was involved in, in the, I guess in about two years ago, where we did a call for artists 
and we're going through all these, you know, wonderful proposals for work. And we're trying to think of from a curatorial perspective, like what sort of fits together and how we create an experience because it was a performance, um, a performance um, festival. How do we create an experience? And of course, curators are limited by the submissions that they receive. So in our process, we found that we had an overwhelming number of women who submitted. Performance tends to, um, there tends to be a lot of women who um, engage in performance practice. And so in that process, we were we're like, okay, well, where's the men, (laughs) right? Which is something that, you know, most people are not asking right now. And so we were thinking about, yes, women, you know, the idea of woman is perhaps diverse, but in the context of this festival, um, we needed representation from other groups of people as well to truly make it pluralistic. And so, and so that's why I think that, you know, when Ashley was talking about representation versus diversity versus um, equity, like we have to have all three of those ideas and because they're nuanced and they work together. So to the degree, I think that, and that's, I think that's what you're also, Corinne, what you were talking about in that you're really dealing with these terms. Like how do we deal with the definition and the value and the context of these specific terms? Like how were they used? How are they being used now? And how can we transform those tools in order to be a method for discourse to not only break down existing discourse and platforms and modes of thinking, but how do we use the transformation of those words to create new opportunities and new forms of thinking? So I think that what, what Ashley is saying here is very much in align in alignment with what you were talking about. I don't know if Ashley, you want to add on to that. No, I definitely agree. I think in, it's just too, I think that because you know, in an American context that we do, there's so much that has, there's so many cultural nuances and like uh, to really think about, you know, the impact of language and unpacking those nuances. I mean, that's something that I've run into with my own curatorial practice and understanding that like uh, how important language is or what I may say is one thing might be completely different to the community that I'm working on. Uh, But I do feel like they're they're very much in line. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I was interested in, in, reading and, and learning more about the radical diversity and, and how it can be applied to um, a, any type of practice or as, as a um, less of a theory and more of a method that I feel like is something that does show up in the work that I'm, I'm curating. Um, and in terms of how I'm working with curators, uh, I mean, my practice and my foundation for curatorial work is really modeled after uh, George Sissel, who is the founding director of The Contemporary, which did Fred Wilson's Mining in the Museum. And his kind of core context is art and audience is everywhere. Anybody is, can be an artist. Um, and that all, and, and all artists matter. And that collaboration is key. And I think those, in terms of looking at that from a non-hierarchical lens of art world and way in which we're organizing um, and bringing in radical diversity, representation, and equity, I think those all make a really interesting kind of um, practice. Yeah. Um, so I think I'll start talking about Houston as a city, if that works with you, Ashley. So, and Max kind of perfectly teed me up here. He's like, Houston is the most diverse city in the country. How are we going to talk about radical diversity? And we are. So, <laughs> so um, there are... Um, A challenge that faces Houston in terms of diversity is how large it is and its its capacity to um, accommodate and facilitate action within public space. And the size of Houston can be seen both in terms of its physical area and the people that are there. So when we talk about, when Ashley and I are talking about Houston, we're talking about the metropolitan area, which is Houston, the Woodlands and Sugarland, nine counties and about 9,500 square miles. So in perspective, just if you know the US map, um, Houston is larger than the state of New Hampshire, the state of New Jersey, state of Connecticut, Delaware and Rhode Island. And if you drew like a little line around our metropolitan area, you could put Austin, Boston, Chicago, Dallas, New York City and Seattle all in our space. That is how big we are. And if you go from the center of town, you can radiate about 40 miles and sometimes more in any direction. We're 
very, very large. Um, and because we're large, we have a lot of people. So we have about 7 million people in Houston. And, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're particularly dense and this is connected to public space. We have about 3,800 people per square mile. And if you look at New York City, which is I think, the den I think officially the densest, they have 28,000 people per square mile and San Francisco has 18,000. So that's a huge difference in the number of people that are actually like sort of engaging with one another and just sort of happenstancing upon one another. I like to call it the, the, um, the target variable. Like what kind of people are you going to run into when you go to the grocery store, you go to Target or whatever. So what this means is that we have a lot of people spread out all, all over the place. And when that's the case, it's really difficult to get people from all over the metropolitan area to come together in specific public spaces, right? And traditionally city planning relies on public spaces to knit communities together and provide a shared place for discourse. And traditionally that has included parks and plazas, like the square in front of city hall, art spaces and to some degree shopping, all the great outdoor shopping spaces that the US has. But from a political point of view, the, the health, the political health of the city is impacted by how public spaces are actually utilized. So they let us get together, they let us participate together, which Corinne was talking about in terms of engagement and their parades and rallies and protests, which should cause us all to bump up against one another and encourage discourse, right? But if the city is really big, its ability to create these spaces where all these people can gather is very, very difficult. And this, I, I truly believe this impacts the possibility for, uh, for politics. Now, I, know, I love Houston. I'm Houstonian. I've lived all over the place. I think Houston is the best city in the world. But it, and this is not just a problem that, that Houston faces, but it, but it is a problem. So we've got size. And so let's talk about people more in the context of public space. So we have 7 million people. And yes, I mean, depending on who you talk to, first or second most diverse city in the nation. And within Houston, um, from an ethnicity perspective, I'm making sure I get my, my numbers right here. Um, Houston is 36% white, 38% Hispanic, 17% African American, and 8% Asian, which means that our minority population is actually our majority which is very, that's not common, right? And of our, um, we also have like 25% of that 7 million are people who were born outside of the United States. And of course, the overwhelming majority of those people are from Latin America. But our title as diverse to me is like a little bit misleading. I hate to say that because I do, I love Houston, but it is a little misleading. So while our population is really diverse, the way that diversity is able to flourish is limited by just how large we are, right? So I grew up on the north side of town about 45 minutes from downtown. And if I'm going to go to a public space or a rally or a parade, I'm not going to drive 45 minutes to get to downtown Houston, right? I'm going to go to a parade or a rally or a protest that's near my house. So if my hometown, which it, which it, which it is, which it was and it still is because I checked the stats, um, if it's overwhelmingly white, then the diversity of Houston as a metropolitan area is of no benefit to me. I don't have that opportunity that public space provides of like, you know, bumping into people that are like, like I said, the target, <laughs> the target effect, right? So if we bring these two things together, our size keeps us to gather, keeps us from gathering, which negatively impacts how public space functions. If people aren't there. It's not really public, right? And the fact that we're not gathering in this broader sense means that we don't benefit from diversity. And so this, both of those things together negatively impacts the possibility for public space to promote diversity and to function politically, right? And so to the degree that Corinne is talking about agency and engagement and providing resources for people, which are, I think, tenants of what you were talking about in terms of pluralism, like we have, we have a, we're at a disadvantage because there's literally no way we can provide all those resources to so many people across such a, um, a large um, area, um, a large geographic area. So, 
sort of what does this mean? Um, does this mean the public space is failing and that we can't, um, we can't, you know, can't preserve it? I, I don't know, but what I know is that where public discourse is happening right now is, right? So it's not just in front of city hall. It's not just in a park. This is, it's taking place on private property. It's taking place in um, businesses. And, um, and so we need to, as thinkers, I think, be, I don't want to say less concerned, just as concerned about how public space is evolving and transforming to um, accommodate political discourse as we are sort of theoretically, architecturally, urban planning wise, how we're preserving the traditional form of public space. If we're gonna really talk about radical diversity and radical representation, we have to think not just this is where politics takes place because this is where it's always taken place. This is where we have protests. This is where we, you know, we can't, we can't have, we can't think about radical diversity if we're still keeping, if we still keep the same definition of public space. And so um, I am interested in how art spaces are taking up the banner of, um, of public space. So, I mean, first of all, is that their job? Is that their role to do that? I mean, I don't, that seems very complicated considering we've seen people, you know, the artists who um, dropped out of the Whitney, right? Because of the board members association with the um, production of tear gas. Like, is that their role? I mean, can they even do that, right? Can they do that in a, like in a genuine way? Like, what does that do to their ability to gather diverse people if they are aligned with a particular platform or an attitude? How does that impact their ability to provide resources for, their, uh, for a larger audience? So I don't know the answer to those questions, <laughs> but I do know that they're important questions to ask and that Diverse Works and Ashley, that they are trying to test out like what that public political space can look like, how, like what are the limits? What are the limits that artists can push in order to create radical, radical spaces, right? And so I will, um, I feel like that is my segue so that Ashley can talk about some of her work, so. Thank you, Joy. Yeah, I mean, I think the questions that Joy is asking are questions, I mean, like every day it seems like uh, you know, like, what is my role and responsibility? Why is it important to do this project right now? How is it going to implicate what we're doing on our current scale? But then how does it then radiate out into the, the ways in which we work in the field and with our community? Um, I think when talking about space, one of the things that came up for us uh, or for me is that how Diverse Works right now, uh, when I joined them in 2018, they were going through kind of a... Um, a, a program that was thinking about ways in which that we could navigate the Houston as it currently is in terms of how Houston has grown to be diverse and thinking about the space and the way in which um, most of the art organizations are downtown. We're very art centered uh, heavily in one quarter, um, which is usually the Midtown Museum District or Montrose area. And so um, over, as I have been, have work with Diverse Works, we have tried and have done a lot of kind of uh, field work and thinking about ways in which we can support artists and thinking about decentralizing that art scene and how that also helps us go out to areas um, that we may not know what's happening happening there artistically. As Joy said, there's, you know, like um, living 45 out minutes outside of the community, Houston, downtown Houston or the art scene may not be where you're, you're producing content or showing your work. And so um, instead of us kind of going in with a colonial mindset of we're going to pop up and show you what art is happening in Houston, we started this project called Project Freeway, which really had guiding principles what, that allowed us to explore space, to get to know people, and really understand what the cultural energy or pulse was of that space. And then through Project Freeway, we eventually established a fellowship program um, that supports artists that are making work within their communities and within their own networks. And so that is one way that we're thinking about space and kind of, um, I can see in terms of a methodology that kind of decentralizes the arts, art world, but then also um, expands our own art understanding of who an artist is and what can be shown as art. Um, I'm thinking I'm in a very interesting 
part, a uh, space in my career where I definitely am more interested in what art can do versus how art can hang on a wall, which does change the way um, in which our space operates. Um, and I'm really interested in site specific work. And I think um, one of the, the projects that Joy uh, and that has been mentioned is this project called Fire and Movement, which was, um, a, it's, it was a large scale performance that was created, uh, it was, envisioned by Jefferson Pender um, for a, um, as part of our history as contemporary in Houston. And as Joy said, that um, Houston is very vast in its, its space, but Houston also has a, a lack of preservation. And so there are hidden histories all around the, the, the city that may not be well known to different people. And so Jefferson Pender came and visited um, our space. And one of the things that he was interested in was the story of the 1917 uh, Camp Logan uprising. Um, or mutiny is what it's called. And it was a moment of time in 1917 when um, uh, the 24th Battalion and uh, 3rd Infantry was uh, stationed here in Houston. They were here only a month. And of course it was Jim Crow laws and immediately they, there was issues of um, power and seeing military, um, African-American military men uh, roaming the streets. And so uh, within a month, there was so much kind of harassment and um, and issues that there, there was this night where things just kind of came to head and there was this, there was someone who thought that they were coming to camp to come get them after one of their soldiers was beaten by police and put in jail. Um, and they went on to besiege the city. Uh, and so what we end up doing as Diverse Works and with Jefferson Pender is that we, uh, we started here at Center and Moy. And we worked our way to the downtown area and followed the route of the Houston, um, the, the soldiers. And Jefferson's idea was one, to understand what it meant to be mourning with your feet. And then two, the idea was how do, how do people occupy space that has been built over? So in this four mile walk, we had also navigated residential spaces, um, we navigated residential spaces. We were on the streets in Houston, so there was commercial spaces. Our audience was waiting for us along a route where we had four different performance stops um, that led up to a, a larger performance that happened at the African American uh, School, the Gregory, um, sorry, the Gregory Library um, in Fourth Ward, and um, and so we just trucked through the city. And he really wanted to question, you know space and people of color. Um, there was also, because it was 1917 and the militarization of black bodies or brown and black bodies. And, and so um, it was a really interesting kind of adventure to take on. Um, we, as I said, we stopped at different spaces. We honored uh, the soldiers that were here uh, and worked with partners at the College Park Cemetery, Buffalo Bayou Partnership, um, the Gregory School, and uh, as well as, um, there's one more, it's Diverse Works and, and, and we had like a slew of people. Uh, one of the things that Jefferson did not want was police presence. So we actually had to hire and film this as a, a shoot to do it. And we had, but we had police that were shadowing us the whole entire time. Um, and so this was just a really interesting project for us to work on and um, kind of, in terms of when we think about space and how we occupy it and, and taking art in a way we in navigating the city and what that meant. Um, and we got really good responses, but it is something that I, you know, um, and questioning like, what does it mean to do a project like this? How do you continue to work in a way that doesn't just drop in and really continue the conversation? So we had a revisit conversation recently and I've been working with artists, um, an artist, Mike Stevenson, who's, who's working on the pardoning process for um, the soldiers, the 13 soldiers that were actually tried uh, for the, the mutiny on the African, uh, 3rd Battalion. So, um, and so I feel like that that's a lot there to sit with, but um, in terms of just my practice and really kind of being, um, thinking about representation and space and all these things together, that's a, a great project to, to mention. Yes, it's an amazing project and Ashley is probably not doing entirely justice to it because as far as I know, Houston has not done anything like that. Like you saw the 
photos. These are armed people who are walking through major thoroughfares of our city, right? This is something that if you drove by it, you are you have no idea what to do. You have no idea what to do with that. And so the fact that through her role as curator, Ashley was able to not only organize all the volunteers, which in and of itself is just very difficult, but she there was an immense amount of coordination with the city and not just in terms of permits, but making the city and the other entities feel comfortable with doing this, that the vision, like there was a specific vision. It had a, it had something very specific to say and that they had faith that diverse works as an organization, Ashley as a curator and all these things that there, it required a lot of collaboration, a lot of faith in one another. And, um, and yeah, so I, I think that, I think that I, I just want to add that on that Ashley, first of all, like that, uh, that's a lot, that's a lot of work. That's, it's, it needs, it's important work that's happening in, um, in Houston. It very much was a trust, uh, an exercise on trust. Um, one of the things that we actually did for this project and why I think uh, representation is, is part of something that I, I brought up is because we actually had to start rehearsing in the spaces that we were working in several weeks prior before the performance so that people could get used to us in their space. Um, and so that we actually only had the, um, I think we worked, we, it was like six to seven weeks that we were training and on the ground and then we only took the weapons out once and that was the first night it was the night of the rehearsal that we actually had the police called on us everybody i mean we had interactions that were really interesting but in terms of by the time that we had our performance people were like oh that's what y'all were doing i remember you and that was one of the ways that in which we as an organization were trying to make sure that our performers were safe because when Jefferson came to me and was like, I want to put, you know, 15 people of color on the streets. That was a really hard conversation to, to have and think about, well, what does that mean? How do we keep people safe? Um, you know, and how do we, how do we do this so that it is powerful, but, and like your vision is sought, sought through, through to the end, but you know, that we're also safe and making sure that nothing bad happens too. And I think only in Houston and Texas that this piece could have happened. All right, well, uh, Joy, Ashley, um, thank you so much for that um, input and for that um, giving an impression of what Houston is, especially for me, uh, that, was, that was very helpful, the sheer size of the city. Um, also, the concrete work you were doing, there was one thing that I still kind of lingers on in my head, and, and I've been thinking about this quite a lot, it's also with regard to Germany and also with regard to the States, it started when uh, Trump became president that I've, and, and I started watching a lot of like satirical shows to be informed about politics. And I was wondering whether there isn't a change of function every so many years it, that, that different parts of society play. So suddenly politics become the, the place for satire because in a way Trump's like very entertaining, right? He's horrible and you can't believe that stuff that's happening. But at the same time, you're like, you're glued to that stuff that is happening. I can't believe yeah. he's talking about European trees being more explosive than uh, 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 Californian trees. I think he did that today. So you have that on the one hand, and then you have the, the, the like, I don't know, John Oliver, Trevor Noah doing, doing stuff that is kind of, that, that I watch to be up, like to, to be um, um, updated on American politics on the one hand. You see that movement in, in Germany as well. Um, a bit different. What I was wondering now is, if you see the same, like if art, where like if art is, has also is also just now experiencing a change of role or a change of function, because in a way, if you look back in the time, you have someone like White Andy Warhol art that is inspiring advertisement basically, and and kind of like like kind of triggering a development of advertisement to become more arty. Uh, suddenly, what we see now maybe, and that'd be my hypothesis, which I do not really know if that actually floats, but I just to, to pose that to you. Um, that now that art is kind of moving into the public space and into the political space and engaging with that, it may gain a similar role of the kind of opening up something that is then that then can be filled by other actors that are not explicitly artistic. So how's that? Like, how do you see that? You see that art has a bit of an avant-garde function, also an opening up to that not only radical diversity, but especially interaction with state actors that need trust to do that, right? So what you were talking about, Joy and, and Ashley, about like the amount of trust they needed 
to allow that kind of performance to happen. Um, so so I'd, I'd be very interested to hear thoughts on, on, on that. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, there, when I, one of my favorite phrases is personal is political. And I think that the, and especially in, in where we are in an American context, it seems like there are a lot of artists right now that are um, coming from, in terms of an I statement or their own personal experiences and how, and that goes back to the representation and creating platforms of like, um, you know, uh, having their story and their narrative told forefront and how that inherently is a form of decolonization, that it is a form of political action to show up, to have the space, to, you know, bear your, your personal story and your experiences. Um, and I think a lot of artwork is leaning that way, or, it, you know, as I said in, in earlier, that I'm really interested in artwork that holds um, a function beyond just sitting on the gallery walls. And so I think that there are several artists that are, especially when we look at social practice work um, or art work that is socially engaged that are taking the function of art and that are creating, um, you know, movements with it or, you know, using art as a function to contribute to something. Um, a group that I worked with or that I know, um, it's called the People's Paper Co-op in Philadelphia. And they, uh, they work together with the Juvenile Justice uh, Center in uh, Virginia to create a virtual reality based on the, the youth perspective and then a training manual for the, from the youth perspective that then got integrated into the department. Or I'm thinking about um, the climate march that happened in, in New York in 2016 or 17, where there was a curator that was helping organize that and creating spaces so people could come and make signs together that were larger platforms of art. Um, and so, so I think, yeah, that it, it inherently, like we're shifting towards a, a, a way of which art is not just something that hangs on the wall. And Joy, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think that um, on the other side of that, to sort of connect what you just said with what Max said, is that there is the danger of politics becoming entertainment or being purely aesthetic, right? So when, when you have, um, what Ashley's saying is like the political is personal, we have this sort of issue with personal narrative versus historical narrative versus like scientific narrative. We have all of these things sort of jumbled up together, which can be, um, which can be difficult to unravel if you are engaging with, if you're getting your news like from art or from satire, right? Because there is this blurry space. It's like, well, that's not entirely true, but it's really funny, right? But I think a lot of people are getting their news from the satire because it, the news is so satirical now anyway that you may as well watch good satire, right? Like, why not? So, but, but it does produce a problem because like then we are creating all these, uh, we're cre and to, to the degree that art can create a space that can interrogate hierarchies and presuppositions and platforms, right? That it can do that. It also, we also have to ask um, what kind of responsibility it has towards other types of discourse, scientific discourse, historical discourse, all of that. I mean, that's very interesting, right? It's very interesting to me. Um, and then on the other side, you were talking about like Andy Warhol and all that. I do think that what we've seen is that because I think art has created this this beautiful way of talking about politics, right? That there are companies that are sort of taking advantage of that. So if we look at the Apple model, like everyone bought Apple, like iPads and stuff like that, because the ads were beautiful, right? Everything was so beautiful about it, we bought it. So what I think companies are seeing is this beautifully packaged notion of politics and they're jumping on board with it. And you can see all the companies that jumped on board, Black Lives Matter, for example. So that is a way in which you have this curious little connection or corner between art as social practice, right? And you have um, commercialization and social media and all these things working together. And to the degree that these companies who are supporting, I'm just saying Black Lives Matter because I'm just what I just has, have on top of my head, to, to the degree that their support of that is sincere or not, who knows, but they're putting that out there. So I guess to, since I was a little jumbled, I would say that art has had the capacity to create all these amazing opportunities to interrogate and really in some cases destroy 
some things, but we have to be careful to the degree that that sense of aesthetics that is not necessarily as rigorous. So when we start thinking of politics as aesthetics, we start evaluating it in different ways and then it impacts um, impact socially and culturally in a way that I think we should be talking about as well. Maybe that's a little clearer. Yeah. Jo Joy, thank you so much for that, um, I, to, for pointing to that point. I guess um, you can say every person is an artist, but you cannot say that art can solve everything. And I think there's like, to, to think about how the limits and functions of art work and where they, like what the reach of that is and where it stops in a way, um, as a tool and as in its in its capacity to to raise questions but possibly not answer them because I feel like answering questions may be something that is a much more democratic practice in a sense of coming together and actually thinking about that something that you raise joy about public space and the target coefficient or something like the the target uh, 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 ratio of who you meet and who you talk to. Um, I guess there's something that I'm taking from 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 what you've been talking about to now uh, about how art is shifting, but also how art is kind of being built into the way um, um, politics or society functions on a wider uh, scale. And that makes perfect sense to me also as an art and theater practitioner, especially because we I see the same thing happening in Germany with like theater becoming more political and more engaged, especially. But then at the same time, um, um, not crossing a certain barrier because then it becomes bad art. As it becomes propaganda at a certain point, it, it just doesn't work anymore because it's not what art does in a way. It, it, there's a certain limit to, to, to what it can achieve. You know, yeah, can so achieve. I think that, and I think Ashley talked about this, that there's a shift between art as a practice like at versus art as a final object. So it's like sort of not that art is becoming more instrumental than object than object driven. And to that degree, I, I want to ask Ashley, like when we're talking about all the, 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 how all these different narratives conflict and we're talking about really important stuff, like what kind of responsibility do you think curators or art spaces have in sort of verifying information, right? So like, if you have this mixture of people telling personal stories, but you're dealing with very, with things that have happened in the past that have some sort of documentation, like where is that, that limit between the work of art and documentation? I don't know, I, that's like one of my big questions. So I just threw that at you. So <laughs> sorry for that. <laughs> I want to be mindful of time too as we get ready to <laughs> get ready to answer. <laughs> um, I think it's an extremely important for the organization to. I mean, one of the way to to vet sometimes stories or not stories, but like um, uh, the ways in which they organize projects from the very beginning. So the way that I usually do that is when I'm starting to work on a project, I usually form an advisory committee of historians, community members. Um, again, this goes back to kind of like seeing who is out there that knows the history or may have input or may be connected um, and really asking like how was telling, how is working with this artist or working on this project, um, like who is it going to affect and how how will we tell the story? And so starting there is how I work with within the, those limits, but there are a lot of cultural nuances. And I think, you know, it's always some, it's always a negotiation, like, talking to like one of the things that I'm really interested in that I haven't really tackled here in Houston is Houston's indigenous history because we don't um Houston's indigenous history is very complex there's a lot of nuances and so trying to figure out um how to do a proper land acknowledgement who are the the key players here in Houston is something that has taken a lot of time and um and a lot of um you know going back to the to the variations of like making sure you don't step on somebody's toes that you're listening to everybody, but yeah. So there's a question coming in, which is amazing. Um, and and I, I'm taking this chance to invite you all, dear audience, to ask questions. Um, we still got like 20 minutes left, so please feel free to, to ask questions. And the first one I think is gonna be to all three of you, um, Corinne, Ashley, and Joy, which is, how has 
COVID-19 and the transition to virtual activities affected the way public and, okay, this says art spaces, but I think we can expand that to, to um, all kinds of practices, bring people together. And um, because I know of, like in social justice and diversity trainings, also we had to kind of change the way people interact. And especially with social justice, the, the physical encounter is extremely important because we talked about like stuff like discrimination. So like being in one space felt like a necessity. So suddenly we couldn't do that. Um, so let's, let's, let's talk about COVID-19 and how like, I know in the States is still something that is still very, very acute in Germany, it's becoming more acute again, but it has kind of had uh, something we call waves. I don't, I really know if there's a wave in the States or it's just still going on on the crest. I don't know, but um, I'd, I'd be very in, curious to actually hear about about your estimations or assessment on on COVID nineteen and its effects on your practice. And not only me, but also uh, Emma Patterson. Thank you for the question. Um, do, do, does anyone want to start? Go for it, Corinne. Go for it. <laughs> well, I think I'll, I'll keep it very short because um, the question of uh, art, how it affected art spaces is something you should really answer. Um, um, so I would, well, what is still in my mind, like, and what I found so interesting actually about this uh, conversation is this question of the transformation of public space and maybe even the question, <laughs> what is this idea of public space? Like, is it, is it maybe, has it maybe always been <laughs> a fiction to, to believe that there that there has ever been something like um, like this agora place, like this place where everybody comes together and where exchange really happens. So I'm I'm still kind of stuck with this because I think what you're describing about art um, taking over or or kind of filling this um, this void is a little bit a little bit also applies to what we're experiencing in social justice and diversity trainings when people ask us, wow, here in this space, um, it is so like, we have this method of maloke, we, we really, um, it really works to kind of find different perspectives beyond the usual narratives and to really rethink difference, blah, blah. blah. But then people are like, okay, but, what about politics? Like, is this applicable to politics or is it just simply an, another sphere? So yes, this is like, this is something I just wanted to say in general about this question of um, public space. Um, and COVID-19 has, um, of course, for our practice, like our social and diversity practice, it has changed um, the way dialogue can happen at all. Like we, I think in some, um, in some moments we, we became really aware of how, um, like how dialogue is possible, but to be honest in, um, good and bad ways, like it can also have, um, very like positive effects to, to kind of be reduced to this um, talking and, uh, and face, um, but it can also be exactly the opposite. And um, yes, maybe, maybe what, what the places where COVID-19 has actually really raised issues of participation is, where like I would always look at this problem of access to to what is necessary in order to be able to participate in what we are doing, and I think this is the this is the central issue, like uh, who has access and who doesn't, and this has become like a very huge topic 
um, during COVID-19. And maybe it is more surprising how little we felt it in our um, actual training context. Um, I would like to respond to Corinne if I can. Sure, okay, yeah, okay. Um, so you're absolutely right. The Agora is a myth. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. And, um, and so if you, just cause I've studied Arendt, you know, one of, um, Arendt's major critiques of Aristotle's, you know, pol or what she, what she points out, at least in the human condition is that, you know, the polis, like just practically speaking, didn't have women in it. Right. So, so there is this, this, this myth of the great Agora that, you know, gathers everyone together. And that's the same myth that a lot of urban design and architecture has been based off. I love our architecture, but it has been founded on that, on a very specific vision of what public space is. So I, I agree with you on that. Um, and, and to sort of build on that, um, during COVID-19, if we look at the Agora and public space, and we know that performances and presentations, you know, aren't happening because they don't want people to gather, like that alongside of huge public protests is very interesting, right? So protests that I attended in downtown Houston had 60,000 people, right? So if we can't have football games, but we can have protests, like that's interesting too, right? So like how do we prioritize what public space is used for and what it's not used for, what is safe and what is not safe? Because like having a protest during a pandemic in public space, like some people have, some people can go to that. Some people can't, some people are possibly injuring others anyway. So I think that there's like COVID has made the need for public space very urgent, but the way in which it functions, like even practically or from a health perspective has made it very challenging, but crucial, but it's crucial. Um, thank you. Ashley, is there anything you'd like to add to the COVID-19 question? Yeah, I mean, with, with us at Diverse Works, I mean, we've been trying to figure out the best way and going, you know, back to the idea that everybody's either doing things online or they're doing things outside with the internet, you know, thinking about that practical question of public space, like, is it even safe to do something outside, you know? Um, and what does it mean to gather? And so that's something that has been on our mind curatorially, but then, you know, as we're working um, to re, you know, shift all of our program, our building is still closed right now. So, you know, th these are questions and thoughts that are, you know, on our mind, right, you know, as we're building in our future programming. I do see a uh, potential of more art happening in public spaces or outdoors or that are site specific because of where we're at with COVID, for sure. Not only from us, but I, I think other arts organizations too. Uh, thank you. Um, there was something that sprung to my head when, when um, you were answering the question, which was that um, in Germany, we can see quite some um, inequality in the way the demand for um, access to the public space is being treated. On the one hand, you have um, uh, just to give one example, you have the half year, you can't really say anniversary, but by, by lack of a better word, I say anniversary of the of the mass shooting in Hanau, which was um, uh, which was half a year ago, and then they had a they had a protest or a like memory march planned, and there was a huge like, huge crowd of especially po what we call post migrant, it will probably in the states would be called POC uh, uh, activation of people uh, coming there. A Jewish participation, left participation, all that. And that was canceled on the grounds of COVID-19. And people had to stand in like little circles during their morning and and then kind of, and having to leave. And then a, a week later, you had the so-called corona deniers, this is how we call them, corona leugner. They, they do, I don't know if you have that, that but yes, I know you have that. In, in, in Germany, you also have corona deniers and they just come and do and, and they go to Berlin, they came to Berlin to do a Corona demonstration. Um, it was clear they would, they had done that before. It was clear they wouldn't cover their noses. It was clear there would be a hazard to everyone living in Berlin and, and possibly being infected. Um, and that was also at first forbidden. And then there was a huge outcry by um, like a lot of people. And they said, this is a threat to public like the, the freedom of opinion, the freedom of movement. 
And that didn't happen for Hanau. So suddenly you had a discussion that was very unequal in the way it had been treated. And, and then the Berlin demonstration was allowed to go on. Um, so I don't know if you heard about that, but that was actually like, I don't know if you heard about the two cases, because that is especially interesting to see how the demands for access to the public space are being granted to different groups in a different way. And that is really just prolonging uh, uh, the way things have been done before. People are being um, 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 protected in a different way. Like certain people are being less protected than others. Some people are being checked more. Police violence is a big topic and all the stuff that, that has been going on in the States as well. So I see that as, as something that is really a continuation down, down the line, um, even with COVID-19. It just makes things more visible, more clearly. Uh, because the resources are being restricted. And once they're being restricted, you see more clearly who's getting what. Um, and at the same time, and just there was something that Corinne raised in the very beginning, I heard you say in your talk that radical representation, equity, and diversity was the three terms you were using. And I was just wondering whether radical participation or capability or something would be a, a fourth term to kind of add to that, to say, look, but people have to be able to access, to participate before those three things become relevant. Um, is, that some, is that a thought that, that, that you can work with? Or is that something that, that is already included in what you were saying? That, that could have been a question, but it doesn't have to be a question. <laughs> so what do you do with the, with the term participation in the States? Let's do it like this. Is there any discourse around participation or um, does it not like, does it, does it not kind of fit the political scheme of how things are being done right now? Yes, participation is key, but I'm not entirely sure that I, um, that I, agree with the way that you've positioned it. I think that in order, I, I don't think that you can say you need representation, um, diversity representation and equity in order to have participation. And I don't think you can do it without it. Right. So I think that that's the problem is that there is no, there's no process in order to do it. And that in order if that is going to be your, your framework, you're, you're going to have to just make little tiny moves, um, like little bitty tiny advances, because the more participation you get, the more, yeah, exactly. The more participation you get, the more like representation you get, the more diversity you get, et cetera. So it's just sort of this little thing that it, it's not, it's not this nice, neat little process, I don't think. Okay, thank you. That was that was one on a conceptual level. Thank you. Yeah, I see that exactly. I think the to kind of prime, what well, you say, to prime something wouldn't really wouldn't really make sense at all. We wouldn't we and, wouldn't get anywhere. <laughs> no, no, and it doesn't work like this. I mean, we've had like we've moved beyond priming stuff, and, and it makes sense. Um, there was one more question that is well, it 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 is directed at Joy, but I think it it asks everyone to 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 reply if we want to. I will try to read it from you to you. It's from Kirby Washington. And it says, we face the same issues of organizing for racial justice inside of our film unions in Hollywood. And I'd love to hear more about how Joyce's thoughts on this will be expanded. Hollywood's unions are holdouts in terms of maintaining systems of racial and gender inequities. Star, star, star. We have taken to what might be termed social distance organizing, various forms of Zooms, phone calls, Slacks, and even Facebook but I'd love to hear more from the panel. Just for me to know, when you reply to these questions, I do not know if this strike is still going on. So if any one of you knows what the like, current status of the strike of the, of the screenplay writers is, then I'd be very happy to hear that because I haven't heard about that in a long time. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass this question off to one of my co-panelists because I, I honestly don't know much about the strike or any of that. So I am not in the best position to answer that question. So. I'd also like to pass it on. I don't know, Ashley. Yeah, poor Ashley. <laughs> 
pressure's on you. <laughs> I mean, I'm not as keen in Hollywood, but I think in terms of um, organizing issues, I mean, you know, one of the things that I can speak to in terms of how, you know, an artist organized is that it does seem to, it's, it's a process, you know, in terms of, um, there, there's a lot of energy that goes into it. There's a lot of, I mean, different models. There's the consensus model where everybody has to be on the same page. It's figuring out um, how to work with people. Um, I do like how you've been talking about social distance organizing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard because I'm, I'm not really rooted in a Hollywood perspective either. All right. Um, I guess we're getting close to closing up the panel. Um, maybe it'd be it'd be a good idea, to, especially with this last question, to 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 maybe sum up a bit of uh, um, how you think um, art can be a part of the practice of radical diversity. Maybe we do that. It doesn't have to be complete. Just kind of whatever comes to your head. We've we've raised a lot of things um, just to kind of have a bit of a of a not like a summary, not really, but kind of a bit of a of a um, practical collection of what we've been talking about. How do you see this link of art and radical diversity, of the practice of radical diversity? Maybe all of you. I can start. I feel like I'm. <laughs> I'm like hijacking this panel. So oh, <laughs> I mean, no, Rin and Ashley, you're free to talk <laughs> before me. Like, um, so I would say that art as a practice, like as a process, not as an art, like not as an art object, um, has the capacity to bring diverse groups of people together. And I don't think that that process, or the the piece of work has to be political per se. In fact, sometimes I think that when we have participatory work that is not political, we have the opportunity to bring people who have diverse political um, points of view together. So I, I think that the, like what the work that Ashley do, Ashley's doing is very important. I also think there's room for participatory art that's not, not political that could also assist with um, radical diversity. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with what Joy is saying. I think that while there is a, a need or there is a movement for more social and cultural performance and work that is political, that like having the other side that also reminds us of our empathy and like reminding us of memory and nostalgia and like why, like those things are kind of hand in hand. And I think that uh, art shows up in... Um, I mean, I, I very much look at my practice a little differently now, understanding radical diversity and like how I'm actually practicing it as a practitioner and really go back to that. It, I see radical diversity really fitting into the process. And so if you can build a process that is inherently radically diverse with the things that we talked about, I think that it, it would be a really interesting methodology to move forward with in terms of like creating and curating or producing. Um, yeah, I, I very much agree and I find this idea of art as a process and as art opening up a space for, um, for radical diversity as in really creating a public space where per people can meet. I find this very intriguing. I think what I, what I'd like to add is maybe a more outmoded or kind of a more maybe even conservative idea of art as um, kind of being this place of experiment of diversity of um, stories and narratives that are really kind of, that really try to invent or reinvent um, stories that are not, or that try to kind of create something else compared to what in public discourse you would always have as something over-determined by 
what what I've before called like a dominance culture and and these kind of patterns, where art is how I perceive it one central space where those alternative identities, alternative stories, alternative self images can be experimented with and brought out much more radically than in maybe all other spaces that I can think of right now. Um, well, yeah, uh, thank you three very much for the for the discussion. I think it opened up a lot of questions. Today I was doing research on, a, on an artist uh, who, who passed away a few years ago. His name is Thomas Brasch, and he has been asked for answers, political answers, and he came from the GDR, so, and he was Jewish, so he was always asked to answer political questions. And he was like, look, I can't give you short answers. I can only give you long questions. Um, and I, I found like it, it stuck in my head and I really, I really like that. And I think maybe we've just like added a question to the line we've started last time. And, and um, thank you very much for that. I think asking the question is something that, that really um, is happening also, at least as I understand it in art. And I also think, and that, that is something that I'd like to add, that the question of what art is and what art can do has very much to do with the amount of freedom that you have in art. If you look at places like Hungary or, or, or other places in, in Europe right now, the, the spaces you have in art are being restricted severely. So it kind of, it starts to lose this quality of freedom, which is a great loss for society as well, because it kind of loses its place where it can actually think about difference and think about different places and different modes of belonging and all that. So um, I think we should be very concerned about, about those developments. Um, but speaking about the length of the question, there's gonna be another part being added to the question on, of, on October 7th. That time is not gonna be with me, but with Mohammed Amjahid, who wasn't here today, but he says hello. Um, he will talk about something that we have kind of kind of uh, also talked about just a tiny bit and it's going to be about the liminality and safer spaces for artists activists and communities especially in gentrified neighborhoods and he's going to talk with elishiba johnson the co-founder of the black art center wana wari writer and filmmaker charles mudede and rana sun artistic director of northwest film forum Excuse me for not like pronouncing every name right, um, but still it's gonna be very interesting. October 7th, same time like today. I won't say the time because we all got different times on our watches now. Here is pretty late for you. It's noon, uh, uh, noonish, I guess. Um, thank you all for being there. Thank you, Goethe Institute for organizing this. Thank you, uh, 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 Böll Stiftung for paying for it. Thank you, Thomas Mannhaus for being part of this network. And please tune in next time. If you liked it, tell your friends to come. Um, and again, have a great noon. Have a great night. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.